Um, and now I have the, uh, the pleasure of introducing um, Dr. Petrolak, who is Professor of Medicine uh, and the Director of the Genital Urinary Oncology Research Program. Um, Dr. Petrolak was appointed um, to lead the GU Cancer's Medical Oncology uh, team here at Smilo Cancer Hospital and as Gen Director of the Genital Urinary Cancer Research Group. Uh, he is now Vice Chair of the Genital Urinary Committee of SWOG and has led multiple national and international studies in prostate and bladder cancer. He led an investigator-initiated trial of dos docetaxel and estromustine and castrate-resistant prostate cancer, which supported a phase three trial, and then the FDA approval of docetaxel for castrate-resistant prostate cancer. He has been instrumental in the development of immunotherapy, immunotherapy and targeted therapies for refractory bladder cancer. His work with Infortimab uh, supported and accelerated a full FDA approval of this drug. He has authored more than 200 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on prostate and bladder cancer outcomes. Um, and today he'll be giving us a lecture on the integration of novel targeted therapies in the treatment of advanced prostate cancer. Dr. Petrolak. Good morning. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here this morning, and I'll just update my disclosures. I root for the Jets and the uh, in honor of Dr. Weiss on his weekend, since we know that Dr. Weiss is a season ticket holder for the New York Jets. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be talking about the integration of novel targeted therapies in the treatment of advanced prostate cancer. And uh, it's important to note that, that this disease is the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. Uh, in nationally, 258,000 patients will die from metastatic disease. Uh, overall, globally, uh, about close to a million, 900,000 patients will be diagnosed. Of course, we know that the majority of patients are diagnosed with clinically localized disease. About a third of those patients eventually go on to uh, biochemical relapse. And we have a different series of ways that we can get to metastases. They can either have a biochemical relapse, they can go directly to metastatic disease, and in fact, those patients that are initially diagnosed with metastatic disease are called de novo uh, prostate cancer patients. Those actually have a poorer prognosis overall than those patients who go through this particular timeline of uh, clinically localized to a PSA than to uh, metastatic disease. So this is the second most common cause of cancer death in men worldwide and the second leading cause of cancer death in men in the United States. So as we know, Hormone therapy or the deprivation of androgen has been the standard of care for the initial treatment of metastatic disease uh, since, 19, since the 1960s. And Dr. Huggins won the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, that particular fact. And what he found was despite regressions of great magnitude, it's obvious that there are many failures of endocrine therapy for prostate cancer. So the majority of these patients who are diagnosed with metastatic disease will die from metastases. Although if you look at the SWOT data, uh, from the late 1980s, there's still about a 10% rate of, of survival at 10 years. So uh, long-term survival is possible, but not likely. And this is the natural history of, of metastatic prostate cancer. This has changed. So initially, patients were diagnosed with metastatic disease. They underwent androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, then after a period of about 18 to 24 months, they progressed to castration resistance that included a rising PSA, progression on bone scan, or progression on CT scan and soft tissue disease, then the development of uh, refractory disease and death in these patients. Overall, at that time in the early 1990s, uh, the time to death from the patient who was diagnosed with castration resistance was about a year. And we were certainly doing much better than that at this particular point. So androgen deprivation therapy is the mainstay of managing hormone sensitive prostate cancer. But now what we're doing, and we'll talk about some of the treatments that we're moving forward, is we're moving an intensifying treatment up front. And this should be standard of care for everybody. Unfortunately, only about half of men in the United States right now are receiving next generation antiandrogens such as abiraterone, enzalutamide, apalutamide, or triplet therapy with docetaxel and darolutamide or docetaxel and abiraterone. And unfortunately, uh, you know, we, we do know that this has a big impact on survival. And the reasons for this, I think, are multifold, lack of education, lack of financial resources. Um, and uh, this is both from the patient and physician standpoint. But, but nonetheless, all patients, unless they are medically 
uh, yeah. incapable of receiving double and triple therapy should see, see, receive this. So this is what we are now considering to be standard of care. The other uh, issue too is if a patient has low volume disease, which is five lesions on bone scan or less, uh, non-visceral disease, these patients should be offered local therapy with radiation treatment. We, are, we do have some trials going on right now looking at uh, radical prostatectomy. Dr. Kim is running that, uh, as well as ra uh, randomizing those to radiation therapy. So, so this is, I think, an important area is the local control of this disease and how that affects survival. So let's sort of look at the data about doublet and triplet therapy and understand why this is important. Latitude and stampede. Uh, these were the first uh, to look at abiraterone and prednisone uh, compared to placebo plus prednisone, placebo uh, in uh, patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer. Uh, abiraterone and prednisone, of course, uh, these are drugs that are originally approved in the castration-resistant state. As we see here, the hazard ratio is 0 0.66. Same thing with arches and titan, where you're giving either enzalutamide or apalutamide up front, and this is within the first three months of undergoing androgen deprivation therapy, uh, we're seeing hazard ratios of 0.66 and 0.65. These are in all patients, irrespective of the fact of whether they are high volume or low volume. Piece one in Aerosense, these uh, particular trials combined docetaxel with abiraterone and prednisone or uh, darolutamide with abiraterone and prednisone. And again, we're seeing an improvement in the hazard ratio uh, compared to uh, docetaxel. Uh, so that's 0.75 and 0.68 respectively. So the real question is docetaxel versus abiraterone prednisone. That's never been done. It never will get done, unfortunately. But that's the real question. Should we be giving an antiandrogen or docetaxel? <laughs> really no answer to that question at this point. The way I look at this is a high-risk patient, a de novo patient, a young patient, that's somebody I want to give triple therapy to. And uh, the other group, um, uh, the elderly patient, perhaps more frail, lower volume disease, that's the one I'm going to give double therapy with an antiandrogen. So this is how this has evolved. ADT alone, uh, overall survival, 33 to 35 months. Docetaxel, that was the first one to show an improvement in the upfront state, 40 to 48 months. Then ADT plus abiraterone, 50 to, 50, 50 to 56 months. And then triplet therapies, median survival is about 61 months. So we have close to double the median survival by giving these drugs up earlier. And again, this is something that needs to be done in everybody. So this is the landscape. It's changed. You've shifted your drugs for castration resistance up to the castration sensitive state. And then, of course, now what are we going to do when these patients are resistant? So I like to think about this in terms of classes of agents. Immunotherapeutic agents, we have CYP-T, we have pembrolizumab, and we'll talk about the data for that select group of patients who actually may respond to this. We have other hormones. You can switch, but in general, switching hormones does not really give you an uh, improvement in overall outcome or survival. And in fact, docetaxel has a hormonal mechanism. Docetaxel will inhibit the trafficking of the angiogen receptor to the nucleus. And this is one of the other secondary ways in which may actually uh, cause effect. We have cytotoxic treatments with docetaxel, cabazitaxel, DNA damaging agents, uh, RAD223, RAD Pluvicta, which we'll talk about at the end, or uh, Letitia PSMA, and then the PARP inhibitors. Uh, about one in 10 men will have a germline mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, and then somatic, it's close to 20%. So I also like to think about this in terms of symptomatic versus asymptomatic. You want to be necessarily maybe a little bit less aggressive in a patient who is asymptomatic. The visceral disease patients tend to do worse. Uh, in fact, there's a small cell variety, which we won't get into today, uh, which predominantly uh, presents with soft tissue lesions, low PSA levels. And then, of course, pre versus post docetaxel. What do these patients receive in the hormone-sensitive state? We have been behind the lung cancer groups and the breast cancer groups and the use of molecular markers. So the androgen receptor is an important target. Looking at DNA repair, as I mentioned before, microsatellite instability, these all are things that we should be looking at in our patients in terms of how we treat, treat these patients. It's really hard to believe, and I feel like I'm dating myself, uh, but it's been 20 years since we were behind the approval of docetaxel for castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And these are the two trials for castrate-resistant disease that led to the approval of docetaxel in 2004. 
Tax Freeze 27, which was led by Mary Eisenberger and Ian Tannock, was a three-arm study that took the then standard of care mitoxantron and prednisone and randomized it to two different doses or two different schedules of docetaxel, a weekly schedule and every three-week schedule. And our trial in the Southwest Oncology Group combined docetaxel with a drug, one of the approved drugs at that time, estramustine. Uh, it was otherwise known as estracit. Uh, we called it something slightly different because of the side effects. Uh, but nonetheless, the combination of estramustine and docetaxel at least at that point, we thought that that was making it more sensitive to the taxane compared to mitoxantron and prednisone. And this is the survival from our trial that was published in New General Medicine uh, about a modest two-month improvement in overall survival hazard ratio of 0 0.8. And then uh, the uh, uh, Sanofi at that time was a romp long study that uh, was the primary trial with just simply docetaxel by itself, showing an improving survival of docetaxel uh, over mitoxantron, which was the palliative standard of care. But the, surprisingly, at that time, the weekly did not show a survival benefit. So that's not generally accepted. It's a little bit less toxic, but nonetheless, we generally don't use that. So what's, where do we move forward with this? Well, we're looking at combination therapies. None of these trials have turned out to be positive. They've all been negative. And no matter where we've tried to look at combining docetaxel with other agents, uh, either immunotherapy agents, I don't have it on this slide, but most recently we, we, we presented data looking at pembrolizumab plus docetaxel in an international study, no improvement in survival, antiangiogenesis agents, bone targeted agents, no difference. So by itself, it stands alone. Uh, I think part of it is because of patient selection. Uh, part of it is that we have not been biologically selecting our patients. And so one of the uh, I think uh, paradigms I've often used is beware the results of a randomized phase two trial, because often they can be misleading, the numbers are small, and these patients are biologically heterogeneous. Okay, so the first part, immune therapy. What, 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 do we, what do we know in terms of immune therapy for prostate cancer, and how can we improve that? Well, prostate cancer is a pretty much a cold tumor, and if you look at tumor specimens, and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, you really don't see a lot, as opposed to bladder cancer, lung cancer, where you do see a lot of inflammation. So one way to potentially overcome this is to use activated lymphocytes, and hopefully these will traffic to the tumor cells. So CYP-T, uh, otherwise known as Provenge, is an autologous uh, T cell product where the patients have their lymphocytes removed, uh, and then they're exposed to a fusion protein of prostatic acid phosphatase, and GMCSF. And these are then reinfused back into the patient uh, three days later. These T cells can proliferate and attack cancer cells and uh, then cause an antitumor activity. So the fascinating thing about this process is that you don't see PSA declines. You don't see objective soft tissue responses for the most part, although you can see it. Yet you do see a survival benefit. So this is a randomized trial that was published 2010, I believe. And it was the impact study where patients with non visceral disease, bone-only metastases, uh, were randomized to receive CYP-T or a placebo. And there was about a four-month improvement in median survival. Some interesting subgroup analyses from this data have demonstrated that the lower the PSA, the better chance or the better the hazard ratio was. So this may be related to volume of disease. And in fact, uh, the median survival of the hazard ratio is about 0. 0.6, if I remember correctly, uh, for those patients who have a PSA of, of 22 or less. And that's the group I tend to use this in. Uh, also, the other thing here about this, this curve, which a lot of people don't remember, was that they were allowed to have prior chemotherapy or they could have had chemotherapy after that. It was a heterogeneous group of patients. But nonetheless, we did see a survival benefit. So there was a lot of controversy when this came out at that time. Why don't you see uh, improvements in progression-free survival and it does not correlate with OS? Well, that's actually seen with bladder cancer with single agent checkpoint inhibitors, seen with lung cancer as well. Objective responses are infrequent, PSA responses rare as I mentioned before, and the quartiles also correlate with overall survival as I mentioned uh, previously. So there is some stabilization disease going on, and uh, Ravi Madan from the NCI has actually looked this this in terms of PSA slopes and what you see with PSA slopes. And for vaccine therapy or, or, or T cell directed therapy, you see a bending of the curve for the most part. With cytotoxic therapy, 
you're going to see a decline in PSA, and then you return to the same slope after the patient progresses. So that may be, you know, again, it's the different kinetics of the drugs that we're giving. So this is why it's very, very important when you're evaluating particular drugs that you think of the context and the mechanism that these drugs are using. So cytotoxic is going to be a different type of endpoint. Uh, immunotherapy may be something different. So uh, doc, uh, our, our, our Kim, or both our Kims, Dr. Dr. Joseph Kim and Dr. Isaac Kim, have been behind the design of looking at trying to prime these patients in terms of testosterone. Testosterone will basically return some forms of cellular immunity. And we know that there's a trial called the Transformer Study. We are actually giving androgen back to these patients. And the fascinating thing is when you give androgen to these patients, there are changes in the immune system, and there are also changes in androgen receptor expression in the tumor cells themselves goes away. So that may be the reason why high dose testosterone by itself can show a uh, response rate. And there's a rationale for combining these because you'll start seeing uh, the, the macrophages are activated. And so superphysiologic doses of testosterone in men with castrate resistant prostate cancer can potentially potent, uh, uh, potentiate the effects of CYP-T. So this trial is actually undergoing right now uh, looking at uh, combining this bipolar antigen therapy along with CYP-T, and the primary endpoints are the PSA response rates as well as immune parameters uh, that are being seen. So this is actively accruing patients right now at our institution. This is something I want everybody to keep their eyes open for, something called microsatellite instability. This is a DNA repair enzyme, and this is present in 2% of castrate-resistant prostate cancer patients. Why is this so important? I've seen complete responses with pembrolizumab with this particular uh, marker. And every patient who has this marker should be offered uh, a checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, this is an FDA-approved indication. As I said before, only 2% of patients have this. But when we see it, it's dramatic. And we have some patients who are in complete response now uh, for um, actually two years. And the question is, do we continue the androgen deprivation therapy? That's another controversial issue. But none of my colleagues have also observed the same thing. So this is something that we have to look out for in our patients. About three quarters of patients will have some form of a PSA response. One of the other areas that we're actively working on, and, and Joe Kim and I are, are collaborating on this, uh, are the uh, uh, bispecific T-cell engagers. So how do we bring... Uh, bring these particular immune cells to the tumor cells. Well, antigens to something called CD3, uh, uh, you can develop an antibody, you can develop a fusion protein to CD3 plus PSMA, prostate-specific membrane antigen. These can actually traffic uh, these particular T cells to the tumor cells. The trouble with this approach is that you can get something called cytokine release syndrome, which is almost like putting the patient in shock and uh, one of the, the uh, companies called Janix has a uh, system where uh, these particular uh, bispecific T cells are cleaved uh, by the tumor proteases. And uh, this is, was just presented uh, this particular year, and we have patients actively going on this study. They're patients who've had more than four lines of therapy uh, with, uh, who have been added on the trials overall, but 23. But look at this PSA decline rate. Uh, you have practically every patient on this, this particular trial having some form of a PSA decline. And this is also accompanied by objective soft tissue changes. So uh, the rates of CRS have not really been significant. They've been grade one or grade two, but this is something that's moving forward. So again, we're targeting PSMA in a, in a very, very different way than uh, we, we'll be doing with a uh, uh, isotope. A second drug that's also now, we're also evaluating as well, part of larger trial is AMG509. This is a bispecific that recognizes STEEP1. This is a marker that's uh, uh, expressed in a number of different solid tumors. And again, it's an anti-CE3 bispecific antibody. And again, this is the same mechanism. You're actually bringing the, the T cells, or activating the T cells, causing cytokine release and uh, causing potential anti-tumor activity. So these are actively growing patients here, and uh, we've been seeing responses, and it's been very exciting. Okay, so that's the immune therapy portion. We're moving forward on that. What about hormones? It's very interesting. Uh, the gentleman named Jack Geller, uh, who uh, 
who I think was working his lab up until his 90s in San Diego, uh, made the observation in 1969 that even though a patient may be castrate resistant, if you measure testosterone levels in the, in the, in the tissue of uh, prostate or other metastases, <laughs> you can still find testosterone. So there is an autocrine way that you can make testosterone. This is the concept between drugs such as abiraterone, which completely abrogates testosterone synthesis, and salutamide, which is a, a receptor antagonist. And I often see that patients will sequentially be treated with these particular drugs. For the most part, you're not going to see a response. 10 to 20% of patients will have some form of response. The RPFS, radiographic progression-free survival, which is, of course, the time that the scans change, is about three to four months. So there's evidence that there's cross-resistance between these particular agents. There also may be some degree of resistance that is engendered to taxanes if they've received these drugs prior to re uh, receiving uh, uh, docetaxel or cabazitaxel. So the question is, how do we sequence our drugs? And uh, this is just simply a summary of what I mentioned before. Duration of response is fairly short to those, for those patients with, who are being treated with sequential hormones. Uh, PSA declines, fairly modest. There are a variety of different ways in which we can have resistance to these particular drugs, abrat or enzalutamide. There's some common pathways. There are mutations in the androgen receptor. Glucocorticoids will activate the androgen receptor, the L720H is one that, that uh, uh, is uh, mutation in the, in the ligand binding domain of the androgen receptor. That's uh, where the, that position is. That's significant. Progesterone will activate the T878A mutation. There are splice variants. There's upregulation of the androgen receptor. The receptor. There's a specific enzalutamide activated mutation, which is F877L. So there's some common mechanisms, and there are also some specific mechanisms as well. This is one that's been sort of, I think, uh, uh, as in Moby, Moby Dick, the great white whale. Uh, this has been pursued in numerous situations, uh, ARV7, which is basically a truncated version of the androgen receptor uh, where uh, the ligand binding domain is, is abrogated and this constitutive activation of uh, the uh, androgen receptor. And uh, this is, there have been drugs that have targeted this. Unfortunately, they've been uh, not successful. Uh, there was one called galiterone, which unfortunately was being evaluated in those patients who uh, were ARV7 positive. But it turns out that these are very symptomatic patients. So they we were looking at this in asymptomatic patients. They couldn't find them. The trial was shut. So it also may be a mark of the aggressiveness of the disease. Uh, and this, will, as I mentioned before, can mark the, the sensitivity to taxanes. And you generally don't respond to abby or enzalutamide if you have this particular marker. And clinically, we see this. So this is a randomized trial that uh, Johan de Bono ran in Europe. It was uh, called the CARD study. What he did was he took patients who had received docetaxel and had received either abiraterone or enzalutamide. And they randomized them to receive the opposite antiandrogen. So if they got Abby, they got Enza. If they had Enza, they got Abby or Cabazitaxel, which is a next generation taxane. It's FDA approved in patients who have received prior docetaxel. And lo and behold, there was an improvement in progression free survival by about five months and an improvement in overall survival by about two and a half months. So this is clinical proof that this concept of sequencing antiandrogens may not be the right way to go. However, these are patients who are on the antiandrogens, the initial antiandrogens, for less than a year or a year or less. So that's basically marking a biological group that may be different. So it may not be inappropriate for somebody who's been on a hormone for a long period of time to switch. Again, we need some data on that. And then, of course, What's going on in the castrate-sensitive state where you're giving abiraterone or enzalutamide up early? Do you switch them at that particular point? Can you do that? Is it going to be effective? We really don't know because we don't have any data. So this is uh, hard, hard to believe this is a couple of years now, but the funny thing about this picture is neither of us were in the same place when this picture was taken. Uh, wonders of, of AI and, and uh, Photoshop, but Craig Cruz, uh, one of the things that we had at, uh, at Yale years ago, uh, was we had a, a, a seminar that was every Wednesday, if I remember correctly, monthly, where the chemistry department 
and the oncologists got together and we basically were presenting to each other. And when I first got here, Craig, who was the person who uh, developed carfilzomib, which is an anti which is a myeloma drug, came up to me and said, hey, have you, you have, have a need for another agent that targets the androgen receptor? And I said, happy birthday, this is great. Uh, let's move forward with it. And he had all of his people from his company in my office a week later, this is 2012. And um, we were we discussed, started to come up with this idea of looking at protax uh, in castrate resistant prostate cancer. So this is a Yale generated drug. Okay, I think I'm stuck here. Oh, I am stuck. Oh, here we go. All right, so what is a protac? Protac is something that degrades proteins, it takes your natural way of degrading proteins and accelerates the degradation process. So uh, what the protac does is it binds to the target protein. It could be anything, it could be androgen receptor. Uh, this has also been looked at in terms of the estrogen receptor as well. And then it uh, will basically will induce ubiquinization of that target protein. Interestingly, this protac is recycled and we can take out up to 400 copies of the androgen receptor with one protac. And uh, this is where the concept dumbbells come from. That's not because Craig and I are dumbbells, but we've used a dumbbell to, uh, uh, to treat these patients. So there's a ligand binding domain, there's a hinge region, and then there's an area that incorporates the uh, ligase. So uh, AR1, V110 was one of the first drugs we looked at in this particular situation. It was a protein degrader and will target wild type as well as the mutated androgen receptors, and it will degrade the H78A, the H875Y, the FL877, and the M95V point mutations. It doesn't affect L7720H, it doesn't affect ARV7. And uh, this is the growth inhibition that's seen in enzalutamide resistant cell lines on the right, as you see the down regulation of the androgen receptor on the left. So we opened a phase one trial, and uh, it was a standard three plus three dose escalation. Took patients, irrespective of the androgen receptor status, they had to have at least uh, two prior systemic therapies, one of which had to be abiraterone or enzalutamide. Uh, some of these patients had uh, four or five prior treatments, and we were looking at defining a uh, maximal tolerant dose. So this is actually kind of interesting because what we found was we didn't see responses above below the level of 140 milligrams orally. And we didn't achieve responses in animals until we had a similar level uh, overall. So it correlates actually very, very nicely, the AUC and the CC max. So, uh, and of course, when we look at tissue from patients, we see that there is down regulation of the androgen receptor. We in the, in the first group, we had some fairly nice responses that lasted for quite some time. Uh, this is one of our patients uh, who uh, had a 74% reduction in his PSA, and uh, he was on treatment for about 30 weeks. He had both an 875Y and an 878A mutation. And uh, this is what we saw in this patient with soft tissue regression. Uh, this patient had a bile up, uh, Again, a fairly amount of uh, heavy pretreated. Uh, we're seeing regression in, in the node, uh, and his PSA reduction was 97%. So uh, this is, as we've gone on further, we've subdivided these patients in terms of their mutation status, and we're finding that 46% of tumors that have the 878 or the uh, H875Y mutations have at least a 50% PSA decline. We saw two of seven patients who had responses by resist. And if we look at the different types of mutations, <clears throat> H78H, of course, that's the one that does best. The wild type, we do see some responses, but really not to the same degree, 11%. Uh, the 720H ARV7, as one would expect, the 50% PSA decline rate is fairly low. That's one that's not... Uh, uh, included in the uh, preclinical analysis, uh, preclinical activity, and then less pretreated, as one would expect, uh, those are unselected based on their mutation status, about a quarter of patients. We just presented this data at the ESMO meeting uh, back in the fall, where the uh, median uh, pro pro progression-free survival uh, was 11.1 months, and those patients who did not have 
an L7 to H mutation uh, and had A78 or A78 or A75. And if they had the L702 LH, uh, 8.2 months. So are we moving forward with this drug? No. Uh, several reasons. Number one, uh, there is there are toxicity, particularly <laughs> nausea and fatigue. And uh, we've moved on to a second generation compound, which is 766, which has a broader spectrum of de degradation, which will also degradate 72, a degrade 72H. And in hearing models, uh, it's showing activity. Uh, I can't disclose anything more, but the fact is, is that we have an abstract that's going to be presented at ASCO. It's a slide presentation this year, uh, and uh, that'll be in June. But we're seeing degradation of the androgen receptor uh, with this particular agent. And the interesting thing is uh, that, that there seems to be similar levels of degradation, regardless of the type of mutations that we're seeing. <laughs> Uh, and again, it's, it's targeting these specific mutations. But also, if you add androgen back, and this is one of the things now that, that we're seeing with single agent azalutamide, you can still see activity uh, if uh, testosterone is added back to these particular cells. So there will be a phase three trial, uh, hopefully starting within the next six to eight months uh, of this particular drug. Uh, I will basically say that the, the ligand binding mutations are actually fairly common. It's about a quarter of all patients. So this is something that we'll be testing for, whether the patients have the ligand binding mutations or not. And um, we'll see where that all winds up. The other thing I think it's important that we look at in terms of our molecular selection are PARP inhibitors. And this is data from uh, the stand-up cancer groups, as well as Michigan, Cornell, Washington, showing that the germline mutation rate of uh, BRCA is about 12% overall. And uh, when you start looking at the different, excuse me, the DNA repair mutations, if you start looking at the different pathologic germ cell mutations, BRCA2 is the one that's the most common, 44%. You also see the microsatellite instability, that's again, 2% overall. ATM, CHECK2, these are all uh, present uh, to a lesser degree, but BRCA2 is really the one that we really uh, have to worry about. So there are, are drugs that are approved in the uh, castration resistant state. Uh, Triton 2 look, took a drug called Rucaparin in patients who had uh, prior docetaxel and prior next generation antiandrogens showed a 51% response rate in the BRCA1, BRCA BRCA2s. So this is where the approval of this drug is. Prior docetaxel, prior next generation antigen, BRCA1, BRCA2, no other group at this particular point. These drugs also have toxicity, they're oral, they can be administered, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but you need to monitor these patients carefully, at least on a monthly basis. Thrombocytopenia, neutropenia are seen, same thing with nausea, fatigue, and the senior are also seen with these patients as well. So you may have to stop their treatment, transfuse them if they develop anemia, uh, dose reduce when it's appropriate. How do we sequence these drugs? Well, the Triton 3 trial helps to give us some information about that. So this took patients with a BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation or an ATM, and these patients had a prior next generation antiandrogen, and they were randomized on a two to one basis to receive Rucapra or physician's choice of treatment, which could have been docetaxel, it could have been a next generation antiandrogen. And so, the group that showed the most promise here were the BRCA altered subgroup, where we see a hazard ratio of 0 0.5 compared to physician's choice. That's all the treatments that are lumped together. Recapra was superior. The ATM group doesn't show that. And this is a common theme throughout all the PARP inhibitors. The ATMs or the non-BRCAs really are not as active uh, in this disease, or at least some of the PARP inhibitors. And there's no difference in the overall uh, RPFS. When you break up the patients based upon next generation antiandrogens or docetaxel, uh, there's less of a separation. It's about a three month se separation in PFS in favor of Rucaparib. Uh, and there's more of a separation when the next generation antiandrogens are given. Makes sense, We've talked about before. They're not as active. Docetaxel is a more active drug in the situation or taxing. So that's, that's consistent. Um, Survival, not mature yet, but it's trending in the right direction in favor of recapturing. So 
we like to use and androgens, uh, excuse me, we, we feel that these drugs should be used before taxanes. Uh, unfortunately, Mucapro is not approved in that situation. Olaparib is. I'm going to be talking more about Olaparib in a few moments. Uh, but Olaparib is approved in those patients with a variety of DNA repair mutations, as well as uh, those patients who received abiraterone or enzalutamide. You don't have to receive docetaxel from Olaparib. So I mentioned before, 10% germline, 20% of patients have some somatic mutation. That's a select group of patients. How do we improve upon that selection? How do we make cells more BRCA sensitive? Well, uh, we can enhance blockade of angioreceptor signaling. That's going to basically cause more bracca in patients. So uh, there'll be failure of AR-dependent localization of PARP genes to the target. Uh, by enhancing angioreceptor signal, signaling uh, or inhibition with drugs like abiraterone or enzalutamide. You're going to see PARP-mediated nucleosome remodeling abolished. You'll see transcriptional downregulation of the AR targets. And as I said, you're going to induce brokenness with this. Decreased DNA gene repair, decreased double standard uh, DNA repair, as well as sensitizing uh, to radiation. And this may be one of the reasons why we see sensitization with radiation uh, with hormone therapy as primary treatment. So magnitude, uh, neuraparib plus abiraterone versus uh, placebo plus abiraterone. Uh, this, this trial was designed to look at a variety of different mutations, both in uh, th those patients who have DNA repair mutations, as well as those who did not. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, see if you're inducing brackiness in those patients that don't have the repair mutations. Uh, these patients could have had less than four months of a prior antiandrogen, and this is going to be an issue with these particular trials, because if we're moving our treatments up front, are we still going to get the same benefit? So if we're looking at RPFS in the BRCA1 mutated patients, we're seeing a significant improvement in uh, the radiographic progression-free survival in favor of the combination. You don't see it for those patients who don't or uh, DNA repair negative, and the BRCA1, BRCA2 seem to do the best here. So magnitude showed an improvement in that group. As I mentioned before, those patients who did not have DNA repair mutations, they did not have a significant difference. Propel, Olapra plus abiraterone versus placebo plus abiraterone, first line, castration resistance, uh, these patients were, again, uh, stratified based upon a metastatic site. Uh, there was a retrospective analysis done of the DNA repair mutation. So uh, this, there was a one-to-one -one randomization. For all patients, there was an improvement in radiographic progression-free survival. This included those patients with DNA repair mutations, as well as those who didn't have it. Uh, but again, when you separate these patients out, hazard ratios for those patients are mutated, not necessarily, uh, it, it's, it's closer to the one, the BRCA1, the BRCA2 seem to have the best analysis. And then the final overall survival analysis did not show any improvement. TALPRO2, different antiandrogen, enzalutamide, different PARP inhibitor, uh, which is talazoprib, and uh, this is compared to placebo plus enzalutamide. Uh, these patients were stratified based upon the DNA repair mutations, and for uh, all patients, again, we're seeing an improvement in RPFS. Uh, in the HR deficient patients, you're also seeing the uh, improvement in RPFS by about nine months. So the, the indication here is broader for this particular combination, whereas the other two are limited to the BRCA2s. Bracca, and uh, so th those are how, at least the, the, the data from the, the, the uh, randomized trials. So how do I incorporate this into our practice? Do I add a PARP inhibitor on to somebody who has a BRCA mutation and they're on next generation and androgen? I generally don't. I generally will treat them sequentially. There are, it are toxicities with the combination, including pulmonary emboli or vascular events, so I tend to shy away. I haven't seen data saying that that's going to show an improvement, so I don't do it. If somebody comes in who's naive to a next generation and androgen and they're a BRCA2, I do use the combination. I've got a patient right now who is on talazoprib plus enzalutamide who's doing really, really well. He's been on treatment now for close to two years. So I think it's appropriate to give it if they've not received next generation. This population should be vanishing if, if we're doing our job right. 
uh, but nonetheless, uh, they are out there. Imaging. So what are some of the imaging agents we use right now? We're, we're seeing a proliferation of the use of PSMA PET scans. Um, and as we know, PSMA is something called prostate-specific membrane antigen. It's expressed in about 90% of prostate cancer cells. So a negative PSMA PET scan doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have disease. Uh, and in fact, the neuroendocrine small cells don't make a lot of PSMA. Although my best response to lutetium PSMA is in a patient who's got a small cell cancer who has had an SUV of close to uh, uh, 20. So um, the situations where I use PSMA PET scans are those patients who I'm trying to detect occult disease, rising PSA, high-risk localized patients, or if I'm considering a patient for a PSMA-targeted therapy. I don't like routinely using PSMA scans in those patients who are metastatic. We know that they've got metastases already. The reason being is that you tend to miss metastases to liver. And I've had several situations where the PSMA imaging in the liver was completely negative, and we've done other MRIs or CT scans and have not have picked up liver metastases. So they don't make a lot of PSMA. So it's something you need to be thinking about in your patients. Letitian PSMA, this is a way of delivering a beta emitter to uh, patients with prostate cancer. It targets those PSMA positive cells. The impact trial, the, uh, uh, the trial that led to the approval, uh, the vision study, uh, which led to the approval of uh, uh, Letitian PSMA uh, randomized patients to uh, Letitian PSMA versus standard of care. That was generally next generation antiandrogen. Uh, patients were allowed to receive prior chemotherapy. Uh, they could, uh, could not receive immunotherapy or investigational agents in the standard of, uh, of care arm. Um, so let me just move forward. So we're running a little bit out of time. Survival curves. This trial actually had two different iterations. Uh, there was an RPFS set as well as an overall survival analysis. They actually had to restart the trial at one point because of some issues with it. Uh, but there was an improvement in RPFS in favor of the PSA by about five months. And uh, the hazard ratio for overall survival uh, was 0 0.62. It's about a four-month improvement in median survival. Uh, pretty much all groups that were entered in this trial had some improvement uh, in survival. Uh, they're based upon race. Uh, there were a very small number of patients who were of Asian ancestry. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't really count that. Uh, but again, whether they were Caucasian, African-American, whether they had uh, high LDH, uh, whether they had uh, uh, angiotensin receptor inhibitors as standard of care, uh, it's not really, we see a, a benefit. Now, where do I use this? I use this late. And what we're tending to see with this particular agent <laughs> is refractory thrombocytopenia. And uh, so I will basically offer patients clinical trials, uh, abiraterone, uh, excuse me, clinical trials, uh, or other chemotherapeutic agents first, because if I can't get their platelet counts back up, uh, then there's nothing else I can do. I can't give them cytotoxic therapy. I can't get them on clinical trials. It's a small fraction of patients. Uh, I think it's predominantly those patients who have a lot of bone disease. The patient who's really an optimal patient for this is a patient who's got a lot of soft tissue disease that's imaging positive and minimal bone disease. That's where we've seen probably our best responses with it. Uh, there are other agents that are now in play, alpha emitters, which cause double sterling DNA breaks. Of those you'll be seeing clinical trials in the future. So in summary, in hormone sensitive prostate cancer intensification treatment with either double or triple therapy is standard. All prostate cancer patients should be tested for microcytal instability, mutational burden, DDR mutations. Checkpoint inhibition therapy is an appropriate treatment for those patients who have microcytal instability. PARP inhibition is appropriate for those patients with DNA repair mutations. Sequential antiandrogens does not improve survival, castration resistant disease. Um, and uh, it seems that the PARP inhibitors are less effective in those patients with, a with ATM. Alaparib is FDA approved in castrate resistant prostate cancer patients with HR gene mutations who have been treated with enzalutamide monitor abiraterone. Rucaparib a smaller group of patients, the BRCA mutated patients. Uh, right now, it's not yet approved for a treatment prior to docetaxel, but I think it should be. And then lutetium 177 PSMA is FDA approved in patients with uh, prior antiangiotherapy therapy and prior chemotherapy. So I'd like to thank the attendings of the GU DART. It's no longer the DART anymore. I can't remember what the name is. 
uh, Joe Kim, Mike Hurwitz, all my colleagues in the urology department who uh, are working on a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, Shelby DiCarlo, who really is the research nurse, uh, who uh, is um, um, helps to run the show. Uh, Destiny and uh, Donna, who are nurses in our group, who are, are really excellent in really manage our patients to a T and our project manager, Angela Davis.